of Life Church. My name is Vitaly, and I'm really happy to see all you guys. And I want you guys to turn to each other and greet the neighbor next to you and tell your neighbor you're so hot because it's 107 outside. Awesome, guys. And before we continue singing, I just want to... I want to read a short passage from the Bible. I want to lead us in prayer. And so we can just set our hearts to worship. And I'm going to read from Romans chapter 14, verse 11. It is written, Surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will acknowledge God. And I want to congratulate you guys all today because the Bible says that every single knee on this whole planet is going to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, but we're the first ones. Everyone's gonna acknowledge that Jesus is God. Everyone's gonna realize that he came down to earth and died for our sins, but we're the first ones. And I wanna set our minds on that. We're gonna be singing about the name of Jesus in the next song. We're gonna be glorifying him. And I want us to think about what Jesus has done for us, what his name means to us. And um, let's just continue worship and let's pray first. Lord, thank you that we can be in your house tonight. Thank you that your house is full, we can hear children laughing, we can hear people talking, we can, there's a band playing and we have, we have a message to listen to later today, Lord. I pray that you bless this service. I pray you bless every single heart here tonight, that our heart will be open, open to worshiping you and be open to hearing what the message today is, Lord. I pray that you change our hearts and our minds as today. In your name, Lord, I pray, amen.
All right, you guys are all welcome to take a seat. And before we continue worship, I just want to run through some quick announcements of things we have going on here at Spring of Life Church. And if you're not here during the weekday, I want to tell you, you're, you know, you're slightly missing out, slightly missing out because what happens on Sundays is only a small portion of what happens here at Spring of Life Church overall. And the first thing I want to announce is it's starting next week is our youth open house day or open campus day. So if you're a young person and on Wednesday nights, you have nothing to do, there's no, you don't want to go to a coffee shop to do homework because there's no homework right now. You can come to church every single Wednesday at 6 p.m. We're going to have sports, coffee, games, uh, sometimes a movie, and various activities by our youth team. And they just want to have all our youth come to church on Wednesday nights, spend time together. I know we all have a lot of free time on, in the summer, so we want to encourage all the youth to come out to church on Wednesdays for open campus. Then on Thursdays, if you're a teen, every single Thursday, or sorry, this upcoming Thursday, or is it, it's in a week, so next Thursday. Sorry, uh, next Thursday, we're going to have a teen service. So if you're a teenager, if you're, you have teenagers, if you're a parent, please make sure your teen is here on a teen's service. They're going to have a really good time. They're going to have a special word, worship, and fellowship together. So encouraging all teens to come out to this teen service. Then I want to talk about our youth camp. So all our young people, all our youth, in Labor Day weekend, we're going to have our youth camp in Oregon. And if you guys look at the dates, you'll see that this year it's one day longer. So for basically the same money as before, you're getting an extra day of being at camp, an extra day of chilling in Oregon. It's going to be a really, really good time. And I encourage all you guys to sign up. And August 1st, I know August 1st, the price is going up. So if you want to save some dough, make sure you sign up before August 1st for the youth camp. And our last announcement before offering is our Soul Lounge. If you come here today and you want to you stay after service, but you, you don't want to go home. Uh, if you go home, you're missing out on a large part of what makes Sunday night at Seoul really special. Um, after evening service, we're going to have some food outdoors. We're going to have a coffee shops going to be open. We're going to have some drinks. And we're going to be doing some singing and hanging out here at night um, until basically it gets dark and we kick everyone out. So do not go home. Stay at Seoul Lounge. And now I'd like to welcome you guys all to stand once again. We're going to pray for our offering. And our offering is just a time we continue to worship God with our finances. And in our offering, we have three ways you can give. We don't have a physical method being passed around, but if you do want to give cash or check, we do have a bucket outside on a way out. But you can give online or text message. And again, I want to remind everyone that if you're a first-time guest here, this is not for you. You're no obligation to give. We just for our Spring of Life family is how we honor God and how we continue worshiping through giving. Lord, Thank you that we can be in your house tonight. Thank you that we have so much going on here at church. We, every single day of the week, our church building is full of people, and there's things going on, and there's different ministries here. Lord, and I pray that you bless this upcoming offering, that um, every dollar and cent that we collect goes to further your kingdom here in Sacramento and around the world. In your name, Lord, I pray. Amen.
Check, check. The suspense is real. Thank you for that. One more time. Thank you. Okay. You guys may all be, please be seated. I won't keep you standing. We'll just have me do all the standing. And if you guys would be so gracious, the talking. Um, thank you, band, for the worship. They were just eager to go into another song, but I said, it's now my time. Um, I want to say that I am I'm very glad to see this building so full of people. And if you guys know how much the evening service has progressed over the years, and you know that sometimes we would have about half this crowd, the people that have been here for a couple years, you know what a big blessing this is. So let's give each of us a round of applause and say praise God that this building is full, that I'm not talking to myself, that there are ears that are listening to what I'm about to say. As you guys all know, we've been going through a series of seven words that will change your life. And of course, they save the best for last, and that's why I'm here. I'm talking about the word wow. And a synonym for wow, because wow is not actually found a lot in the Bible, but it's just a more contemporary word. The word that we were talking about is awe, A-W-E, and it's the first portion of awesome. So when I'm gonna be saying to be awed by something, just translate that to, I think that it is awesome. Simple enough? And so let me ask you this first. When was the last time that we have genuinely been wowed or awed or thought something was awesome? I was sitting down, I'm thinking about it, and I'm like, okay, I mean, I was, I've, I've been shocked lately. I've been surprised. You know, you pull up to the gas station, and you're like, this tank used to cost me 50 bucks. Now it's about double. That's shock. It's not really a wow type thing. It's not awe. I'm not happy to see that. It seems that we've all just kind of become desensitized to things around us. And that is not what God had in mind for us. God's intention for us was to look around at the things around us, to be amazed by them, to think that they are awesome, and it essentially they are to point to God and his glory and power. So I would like to discuss the three areas of our life where we should feel awe, where we should be wowed. And the first one is creation. Psalm 19, one says this, the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. So we, we all know creation and how that went down. And we know that the, those things are there, but we wake up and there's a, a sun above us and we you know, are standing on dry land and there are trees and flowers and everything around us and we're like, this is how the way things are supposed to be. And we don't even think about it. But when we start to talk about the stars and the moon and the suns or the one sun that we see, we begin to understand that there's a lot of time and thought that went into placing things where they're at. The earth at the certain tilt that it's at, um, the sun, the certain distance that it's away from earth. If it was any closer, we would burn up. If it was any further, we would freeze. Time went into making this. And when we start to really think about it, we come to the conclusion that there's only two possible explanations for the things around us. The first being is that it was all a chance. It was all a coincidence. It was a wonderful, perfect accident, a big bang, if you will. And the other option is someone made it that way. And as I was thinking about that, a story from my childhood came to mind. This was back in middle school, so I think you're about 12 at that age. And this was back when, when you'd come home from work, I'm sorry, <laughs> when you'd come home from school, you would actually go outside and play with your friends. It's a little different nowadays. But you would get on your bike and you'd ride around the neighborhood looking for trouble. And one of the things we used to do is this thing would only, this awesome experience would only cost you $2. And let me explain. You'd go to your local Dollar Tree and you'd walk in there and you'd get a roll of aluminum foil 
And the second item is a household cleaning solution. I'm not going to give a specific name of it because I don't want you to encourage to do what we did. But you would take that aluminum foil, you'd get a water bottle, you'd roll up that aluminum foil, you'd drop it in there, and then you'd take that liquid solution and you'd pour it just enough to cover that foil, you'd shake it, close the lid, and you'd run. And due to some chemical reaction that I could not explain, nor did I really care because it was just so cool, a gas was formed and the bottle expanded up until the plastic stretched and then a big bang, an explosion. And the explosion in size would vary depending on how much foil, how much solution you'd pour, and how big the bottle was. And so we'd start with the water bottle, we'd work our way up to a two liter soda pop bottle, then we'd start get, getting creative, we'd put that bottle inside a box, just to see what kind of stuff we could blow up. We were 12, and out in the wild, in nature. And the aftermath, we would return back to try to see what's going on at the point of detonation, ground zero, and we would see a couple things. The liquid. Now, instead of blue, there's your second clue. Instead of it being blue, it was black and fizzing and bubbling like some poison. And then the aluminum foil would be smoking because it just went through something serious. And what's unique is you would look at the aluminum foil, and surprisingly enough, it wasn't a pot or a pan for your mom. It wasn't a new mailbox or whatever is made out of aluminum. It was still just a bunch of mess. Now, if you're catching on to what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to, the connection I'm trying to make is a big bang or an explosion of randomness or a chemical reaction, how can it form something new, a new creation, something intricate, something so specific and detailed? We have day and night. We have the sky. We have dry land, seas, grass, herbs, trees. All these things are made, and you're trying to tell me that it was all because of an accident? Whatever you're selling, I'm not buying. I think a creator made it. And if we look in Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, it says the following. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now I want to focus on the words that are in red right there. Pleasant to the sight and good for food. Not only were the trees that were throughout earth meant to provide us nutrients and food and things like that, some of the trees were meant specifically just to be pleasant for us to look at. Now, when you think of it that way, if the trees were designed for us to look at and be in awe, to be wowed by them, maybe the mountains, maybe the lakes, maybe the oceans, God created things. God created certain parts of nature for us to look at and be like, wow, that's pretty awesome. We are supposed to walk around. We are supposed to drive around, fly around, and look at things and say, my God is great. He made that. That is not a part of an accident, a part of some crazy collision of matter. Someone made it. It's no accident. Psalm 65, verse 8. They who dwell in the ends of the earth stand in awe of your signs. You make the dawn and sunset shout for joy. Now I know the teens and the youth, if anything in nature uh, catches your eye or wows you, it's sunsets. Something about it is magical when you drive up to that hill in El Dorado Hills and you're looking down and the sun's coming down and it lights everything up in orange. And as it sets and you can just kind of see the sun peeking out from below the horizon, the curvature of the earth, the curvature of the earth. And for some reason, you feel compelled to share your deepest secret or confess your love to your spouse or your friends. Something magical about a sunset. It's not just a planet spinning, is it? There's something that when we look at it, it makes us feel something. But for some reason, we take it for granted. It's just the way things are. The sun goes up, sun goes down. But a certain group of people, I've come to realize, don't see it that way. And 
that's most evident in children. Our friend group that helps make evening service possible consisted of five couples, ten adults, and we used to be able to get together and have a Bible study or have a meeting. And within the past two years, I think we had four or five kids. And that means four or five screaming babies or four or five babies crawling around where they shouldn't be, looking at things, intrigued and in awe. Children are much more wowed or in awe of the simple things that we take for granted. And as they get older, they try to understand these things. They're like, what is this big metal thing here and why is there sound coming out of it? Mom, why? And you're like, uh, well, I'd be a dad and I'd be like, I don't know. It's just, it's metal and there's wires and wires do magic. But we don't fully understand some of these things, but we're just like, there has to be a scientific reason for it and so we're not impressed. It's, it's physical matter. But why is it that we as adults, as we grow up, instead of becoming wiser, instead of becoming more appreciative of the things around us, we become desensitized to it? And I remember a couple years back, this is going to make sense for a few people, and hopefully the people that don't get it, I'm sorry. But there's this guy. Who here is a Sacramento Kings fan? Can I get a show of hands? I see oh, two f hands, and that's okay because we suck. But one day when we come back and we are a playoff team, I don't want to see any of you guys at the games because you guys are all fake. But there is a certain King's personality. A, he's a radio host. His name is Carmichael Dave, okay? And I follow him on Twitter. And a couple years back, he posted the following tweet. Hopefully you guys can read that. And so the context to it is there was previous tweets about, above it. And he was driving through the mountains. I think it was somewhere near Lake Tahoe. And he, his wife turns to his daughter and says the following words. What do you think about these mountains? Pretty, huh? The daughter responds, not really. And his question is, seriously, how long does it take for teenagers to stop being the lamest? At 13 years old, this teenager driving through the Sierra Nevadas, arguably one of the coolest mountain ranges, was like, nah, it's just mountains, it's just snow, it's just trees. I'm not impressed. Try again, Dad. It's kind of sad that we have become desensitized and we don't appreciate all of creation. And I want to hammer this one point home is creation is put into place for us to look at it and understand and appreciate God's glory and that he put it there for us. And now we'll transition to the second point. One area of in our life where we need to be wowed or in awe is in the uniqueness of each human being. Now, I didn't make this PowerPoint. Shout out to the people that did. But even in this picture, you can see there's a diverse group of people. We got some men and some women. We have different skin colors, different hairstyles. And if you, even if you look around us, most of us here are from Ukraine, but we all look so different. And I know within this crowd, I think we have only one group of twins. Shout out to Ed and Daniel. And I kind of know them. I know one of them does the lights, and he's pretty good at it, and the other one helps me set up couches outside. But if you put them next to each other, and they like to wear the same clothing often, if you put them next to each other, I couldn't tell you who's who. But even they are different. Psalm 139 we're going to read up verses 13 and 14. For you formed my inner parts, inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. If you look at the words in red again, I like to highlight them because I just want to focus on those. You formed my inner inward parts. You knitted me together. This kind of ties to the first point is you are not here by accident. You are not here because one cell and another cell came together. Although that is true, God had a special plan for you. He designed you. And just the fact of how the human body works, I am no doctor, far from it, but I know the human body is amazing in how it works. 
I recently went through a bit of an injury. I've actually had a pretty couple of rough years in terms of injuries, bad luck. But I was at a physical therapy appointment after my knee got rebuilt. And it was a month or so afterwards. And I was regaining mobility. I was able to walk. And I'm walking out of there, and I just went through a, some stretches with the physical therapist guy. And I'm walking out of there. I'm feeling good. I'm like, wow, it's only been a month, and I'm feeling pretty good. And then I see a kid pulling up in a minivan. His mom's dropping him off. He's coming out, off, out of it in crutches that I had a month ago. He's wearing that knee brace that's locked it in place. And he's like, oh. he's in pain. He's just in a bad place of his life right now. And I almost want to say, buddy, just you know, keep the faith. Your physical therapist loves you. He's going to do some work on you. And in a month, you're going to be able to walk. But it's amazing that our body is able to recover. I put a couple of stretches in there. I did a little bit, but my body accepted this new tissue. My body's, the muscles are helping stabilize it. We are made very well. And more so, we are unique. We were designed. Now, I used to play some games online, on the phone, whatever. And there's this feature you could do where you're, like, you're building something. Let's say Minecraft, right? You don't want to build the same 50 blocks over and over and over. You could do a copy and a paste, right? You just select a certain section, and you paste it right there. And you just have two of the same thing. That's not the case with humans. No two people on the entire planet are the same because you were designed. If I can get the next slide up there, the one with the chair, yes. Who here knows what that is right there? Or the name of the chair, or who made it? No one knows, and this will be a fun lesson for you guys. This chair was designed by Charles and Ray Eames in 1956. At that time, 1956, that's more than 70 years ago, this chair would sell for $310 in 1956. They still produce this chair to this day, and depending on the materials that you get, it's going to run you between $4,000 and $7,000. Now, this is not the most expensive chair in the world, but many believe that this is the most comfortable chair in the world. And it's nothing really that special. You got an aluminum base, you have some plywood that's molded together. It might come in a different stain, it might come in a better or worse weather. But for 70 years, they've been selling these chairs for crazy money because two guys came together and designed something cool. For 70 years, people have been buying this and it's a staple in their house. They don't hide it in their basement in the man cave. They put it smack dab in the middle of the living room and they said, I got myself an original Eames because it's cool, it's stylish, it's comfortable. $7,000. And it was designed by two humans, but you were designed by God. And I, I promise you, there's thousands of these out there and you can find many that look alike. You are individual. God designed you individually, one of a kind. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul writes, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship. We are, he takes pride. Workmanship in something that you make and you spend time in and you are proud of it. It's not, this is just what I do. This is just something I made. You, we are workmanships, individual, crafted, handmade, call it. And I want to ask you this. When was the last time you looked in the mirror and you thanked God for who you are? When was the last time you looked in the mirror and instead of noticing that flaw, you said, God, I thank you for making me, me. Thank you for the features that I have. We each have our little quirks things that we're not really proud of, some little gimmicks, if you will. Um, when I was in high school, when, when I was in high school, I took an art class, and I'm, I'm not a painter or a, an artist, but I took this class because electives and my friends were in it. And the high school teacher, he said, we're gonna draw self-portraits. And I'm like, cool. 
I'm just going to make a really tall stick figure. He's like, no, you're going to make a, a self-portrait of just your face right here. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. He handed each of us a mirror, and he said, start, start drawing. And he kind of explained to us the general rules, how you, you start with an oval, your eyes are about two-thirds of the way down, depending on how big your forehead is. And then, you know, you put your nose. And I was doing my thing, trying to get that good grade. And when I got to the ears, I came to a realization I'd never noticed in 16 or 17 years of my life, that one of my ears has a weird bend in it. And I'm looking in this mirror, and I'm in disbelief. And I'm like, how has no one told me? Mom, Dad, I have a bend in my ear. I could have tried to, like, unbend it. Maybe by now it would have been fine. 17 years. But now it's just something that I have. It's, 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 a, it's, I can't call it a defect. It's what makes me unique. And I hope the camera people aren't zooming in right now, so I'm just going to stand like this now. <laughs> or is it this year? Uh, that was what made me feel special at the time. And we all have that. When we waste time trying to be someone else, or wishing we had someone else's appearance, someone else's personality, someone else's abilities, we are, I'm not sure what the right word is, we are being rude, we are dishonoring God. We're saying, God, good effort, thank you, I like most of it, but I would change this and that. I don't like this and that. You almost passed, but I wish I had Voss's blank. I want to be like him. That's just not right. God made you the way that you are for a purpose. He wants you to look at yourself, and I know self-love is like a new movement and stuff, and it might not have the best origin, but there's some truth to it. God wanted you to look at yourself and say, I am wonderfully made because I have a wonderful creator, a designer. We need to be in awe of what we are, and that's applying to ourselves. When we're looking at other people, God made them unique, God made them special, God designed them. And the gifts we see in others, or their features we see in others, should not bring out jealousy or anger. When we become secure in who we are, when we are confident in who we are, Instead of being bitter and within ourselves, we get to encourage others, and they'll encourage us, and we just, we can further God's mission instead of just being dwelled on our physical appearances. Be wowed by who God made you to be. I can guarantee you, 100%, there's always gonna be someone that's better looking than you, someone's gonna have a better job, someone has better abilities, play a musical instrument better than you, but God made you you. He, made, he wanted you to be that way. So stop trying to be someone else. Be wowed by who God made you to be. And the third thing, God's word. We must be wowed or in awe of God's word. The Bible is not just a book. In 2 Timothy verse, chapter 3, verse 16, it's written, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. That first section, all scripture is breathed out by God. It is complete. Everything in this book, and between the two sides, it's not there just because. We don't just get to pick our two favorite chapters, and if you can tell, even by my Bible, one section over here, the New Testament, it's a little bit more worn out than the old one, just because some of the stuff is a little bit more applicable to us. All of it, in entirety, is God-breathed. There's value in there. There's 66 books. It's made up and written by many different people. All of those things are put there for a reason. There's an overarching theme of God's power. There's an overarching theme of God's promises to us. It's his promise in the Old Testament that's later fulfilled through his son Jesus. Everything in there is worth it to read. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12. 
For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints, of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So we know that the word of God is there for a reason. We know that it has power. But in there, there is promises. In there is the power to change us. Remember a little while back we were talking about the gospel and we're talking about the whole process of what the promises of God to us are? And I'm going to just recap two big words. Justification. It's the event that secured our forgiveness. We are justified, free, 100%. Forget about it. Don't forget about it. I'm saying like, just it's done. Keep remembering it. But the second part of it is sanctification. It's the ongoing process of transforming our hearts. And I wanna ask you this, how are, we going, how are we going to allow God to change us, to transform us if we are not spending time in his word? How do we expect to be more Christ-like? How are we going to become more like Jesus if we don't know what Jesus was like, what his life was like, how he lived, how he acted, his heart, his character? That's why today I call all of us, you guys and myself, to read the Bible more. Spend more time in it. Don't just check off that chapter you're supposed to read today. Spend time in it because it does change. It has power. One thing about the Bible that I already mentioned is that it has promises. Some of the promises are is that God will give us strength he will give us rest, he will answer our prayers, he will be with us, he will protect us, he, is, he will free us from sin, he promises us everlasting life. But within all of that, you don't hear promises of a job that's gonna pay well. There's no promise in there of a perfect house, that three bedroom, two bathroom, big yard and a garage, that's not in there. What he continues to promise us is that he wants to work with us. He wants to make us better. Philippians 1.6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. He who began a good work in you. It has already begun. If you accept Jesus into your heart, that work has begun. You're not a brand new person free of sin and you're just blameless and spotless and you, you know, you're going to live a perfect life. The word of God says that the good work in you is going to be working. It's an ongoing process and it will be completed at the day that Jesus comes. To wrap all this up, I wanna say that where we look for awe or what, what we looked at to suppress us, surprise us, to impress us, whatever we're chasing at, that's kind of gonna shift the direction of your life. If we are wowed by physical, earthly possessions, how is that gonna affect your spiritual person? And at the same time, do we take the things around us for granted? When you're driving through Tahoe, are you like, it's mountains, it's just some rocks. I hope they don't roll down and hit our car. Or you're like, wow, those are cool rocks, big rocks that form a mountain range, covered in snow, it's pretty cool. All of the beauty, the sunsets, the sunrises, all of that was put there for us to look at it and remember, a God made that, my God made that. Do we, and that's towards creation. When we look around at others, are we jealous of them? Are we like, I wish I had that? Or you're like, God made me to be me. He made me perfect. He designed me. Not a chair, not a chemical reaction between aluminum foil and something else. He's multiple ingredients. He made me perfect. And how much time do we spend in God's word? Creation. Uniqueness of each human in God's word. Three areas of our life where we need to increase or start being more awed by what God has done, to be wowed. God said, 
that he is with us, that he loves us. He said that we are chosen, we are made uniquely. He designed us. We are not accidents. Every single person here is for a reason. We have great plans. Some of us are approaching an older age and you think you're already all done with everything you have to do. And some of us are but a toddler or a school-aged child. But God made you the way you are. God made things around you the way they are so you can look at them and give praise to them. And the last thing is God gave us his word. That's power, that's promises. Let's read it and let our lives be transformed, amen. Let's stand for prayer and then we'll go into worship. Lord, I thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us health and an opportunity to be here. Thank you for our church that it's full with people and that we're just so happy to see that. Lord, I thank you for everything you created for us, that you created the planets, the stars, the moon, and everything around us, the, the mountains, the trees. Lord, may we look at it and give you the glory that you deserve. May we look at ourselves and not be upset by our seemingly defects or things we're not happy with, but say, you made me this way. Thank you for that. And the last thing, Lord, is I pray that we just learn to value your word more, to be wowed by it, that it has power to change us, or that you want that relationship with us and we can't be more like you unless we spend time in it. Lord, I pray that you bless the remainder of this evening and this service. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much for, yeah, let's give a hand to the band. Thank you guys so much tonight. And thank you for being here. And we want to encourage you to don't go home. Stay at Soul Lounge. Meet some new people. Eat some food and sing some songs. And have a good rest of your evening, guys.